Hello, good evening, and welcome to the couch with me, Amma Pratt. Now, if you are in this county, then you know that in recent times we have been faced with a lot of, you know, security issues. I could go on and on. I could give you examples, but you know, not not necessary. We all know. We all live in this country. We all know what the the, the issues are now. I have a lot of questions about this. What, what what does this say about security in Ghana? What are the implications? Are there things we are not doing right? You know, so what are the real security issues at play going on right now? And if you are like me, I'm sure you have a lot of questions now. I certainly do not have the answers, but my guest in the studio this evening certainly will have some answers or at least can point us to the right direction. So this evening, our topic for discussion is the state of security in Ghana. Don't go away. Stay with us. It's a short documentary. We'll write back. I'll introduce my guest and then we can take the conversation from there. Stay with us. Citizens in every country prioritize living freely without any form of threat to their lives. In relation to this, security can be defined as all the measures that are taken to protect a place or to ensure that people are free from any form of harm. Here in Ghana, there have been instances where this definition has been questioned in recent times due to the fact that there is an increase in the speed of killings of some citizens. In view of this, much panic and fear has done on the general public who feel that their security is at stake. In addition, this has created a dent on the image of Ghana in the international arena. Some other incidents that have broken the array of the state of security in the country include, but not limited to the following. In 2013, Nanekwe and Ankwana, Paramount Chief of Sequa in the Brongahafu region, was shot in the chest by unidentified assailants who stormed his palace. Joseph Bwache Dankwa Edu, the new patriotic party member of parliament for Ibuakwa North was murdered gruesomely at his Shashi residence on February 9, 2016. Major Maxwell Mahama of the 5th Battalion of Infantry was lynched by an irate mob who mistook him for an armed robber at New Boise on May 29, 2017. Nene Achure Benta II, Man Kralo of Pram Pram, was shot and killed by unknown gunmen at Dodoa on December 13, 2018. Reverend David Nagbimado was stabbed repeatedly to death by his nephew at the Tema Community 4 Central Assemblies of God Church on December 30, 2018. Divine Aquino was shot by a police patrol team after a lady lodged a complaint about some unknown persons snatching a bag on January 5, 2019. Josephine Asante, the marketing and public affairs manager of the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, was stabbed to death at her Temer Community 25 residence on January 12, 2019. Ahmed Hussein Swale, lead investigator of Tiger IPI, was shot twice while he drove near the Queen of Peace Catholic Church at Medina on January 16, 2019. What do these killings make of security in Ghana? Does it expose the spate of insecurity in the country? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Hi viewers, welcome back from the break. As I intimated before, our topic for conversation this evening is on the state of security in Ghana. And to have this very, very important conversation, I am very privileged to have with me in the studio, Mr. Ibad Ibrahim. Welcome, sir. Ibad, yeah. Oh, oh, say it. Sunny correct me. Earbud, earbud. But I accept anything Ear from no, no, no. E let, no, no. Earbud to iPad. No, no, no. no. Let, let's, let me get this the uh, right earbud, way. Earbud, earbud, yeah. earbud. Yeah. Please forgive me. Don't worry, that's fine. Okay, so I've just been corrected, and I stand corrected. The name is yeah. Earbud okay. Ibrahim. Now he happens to be a security commentator. Welcome, sir. Good to so talk. Good to be here. Yeah, okay. thank you. Right next to him is a face you already know. You know, on the couch, he's been here. He's a man of the house. His name is. Adib Sani. He happens to be the executive director right. of the Center for Human Security and Peace Building. Adib, always a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Welcome. Right. All right. So let's 
dive straight mm. in. I like definitions, you know, because it normally just sets the parameter for the conversation for us. Let, let's put this in some perspective. When we say security, national security, what's the scope? What's the scope? Okay. Can I? Oh, sure, oh, sure, sure. All right. Um, it's important to first of all put into perspective what security is. Then we can um, appreciate and understand what national security is, juxtaposed with public security and private security. Indeed, security is simply to be safe from harm, but not only to be safe from harm, but even to be safe from the fear of harm. So when you are in a country like Ghana, there's no fighting, there's no war, it's peaceful, but Amma Pratt is unable to sleep with her two eyes closed at night. You are in a state of insecurity when residents of Adenta are scared to cross the road because they fear that they will be hit by vehicles they are in a state of security insecurity indeed security is not all about belligerence all right it's not all about exchange of gunfire security when you look at it from the human perspective as defined by the UNDP 1994 report, take into cognizance economic security, political, community, health, food, and a whole host of others. So when you wake up on your way to work and there's so much traffic, you are very inconvenienced. It's, it's got to do with security. Mm -hmm. So no wonder under Mills' administration, we had the national security coordinator, Gavlulati, mm. pulling down the toll booth into Lagan. Mm. Uh, there was so much uh, razzmatazz around mm. the, uh, 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 the exercise. And many Ghanaians were wondering whether he, had, he should have pulled it down Monday. because it I think didn't the have anything Monday to came up. But mind you, it created so much inconvenience to many motorists on that stretch, mm. okay? Um, it created so so much traffic. Mm. So that means they are in a state of insecurity, all right? Mm. Also, many Ghanaians have had a reason to constrict national security, for instance, to stout-looking men in a Rambo style going to effect arrest. But national security is also about them gathering intelligence on the fact that there's a community and many women without water, and many women would have to walk long distance to fetch water from a river. And before they get there, they are very vulnerable to snakes. They are even vulnerable to armed assailants, etc. Mm. It's a state of insecurity. Mm. It's also about providing the basic necessities of life, mm. such as water, such as food, such as shelter. That is national security. And national security can, is inspired by the 1948 uh, uh, Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights. Mm. That is a precursor to the Bill of Rights that was adopted in 1966 and put into practice in 1976. And it's all, it's all hinged around the fact that you and I and Iran have a right to be secured. Mm. And it is the duty of governments to make sure that we are secured. That is national security. Because um, if you've studied government, we know about social contracts. All right. Yeah. We give them our mandate, our votes. They give us in return these basic necessities, including security. Mm. And private security, on the other hand, is security um, that is privately owned. We have a whole lot of private security firms in the country. Indeed, my brother has a security consultancy, mm -hmm. and that is private security. Mm -hmm. And it's especially important because in Ghana, for instance, the security um, services, national security, are overstretched. So you cannot have, for example, the police everywhere all the time. And so there's a need for you to engage the services of private security firms. Like it is done at Gapoha, you go there, you see the security men mm. from private security firms, some of the banks, savings and loans company. Mm. So that is basically an overview of that, what security is. That's like a really is. broad scope. Mm. I mean, involving 
social amenities even. Indeed. That, that's really bad. Yes. M Mr. Ibrahim. Yeah. Can I keep it safe that way? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think um, my brother Deep mm -hmm. um, really gave you a very, you know, uh, elaborate mm -hmm. definition of security in broad strokes. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, um, the definition he has given, including those mundane things, mm -hmm. you would have on a normal day swept under the carpet, mm -hmm. thinking that this is social. Why should it be called security, security related and all that? And that is the substance of the definition of security. But what we see on the outside is the law enforcement bit and the intel gathering bit. Mm -hmm. So people say, oh, why did the police not do this? Uh, why did the police do this? Uh, so that is all part of law enforcement. And again, Intel is the driving force uh, for the implementation of whatever security policies uh, any country has. And in Ghana, we have three major intelligence agencies. Security and Intel are like twin mm. brothers or sisters. They work hand in hand. Uh, before the police can move in on a building, uh, you must have actionable intelligence pointing to the fact that you've pieced together evidence leading to a culprit mm -hmm. or someone who is su suspected to have perpetrated a certain act. Mm -hmm. uh, so intel is the most important thing uh, because it is in the shadows of national security. Mm -hmm. And when you mention intel in Ghana, people mention the BNI. Mm. Yes, the BNI is I mean, so national popular. national investigation, yes. I mean, come on. Yes. Intel, yes. that's like the obvious yeah. place to, yes. you know, yeah, sure. Um, I, I must tell you mm -hmm. uh, that discussions are ongoing uh, to maintain the acronym, but then change the name. Uh, so in the Bureau of National Investigations, it will soon be Bureau of National Intelligence. Mm. Yes, because the BNI is acted in a much more professional way uh, than it used to in the past. Um, it is not for any reason that the BNI is not in the news too much mm. nowadays because it wants to remain an intel uh, gathering organization for the domestic needs of the country. Mm. But apart from that, there are two other intel agencies that most Ghanaians don't know about. Um, a wing of the Foreign Affairs Ministry is called RD, the Research Department. Mm. Uh, that is our version of CIA. Uh, but not too many people know about that. Uh -huh. So RD plants molds in Togo, Burkina Faso, La Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, so we have a fair idea uh, of what is happening in those countries. And we also collaborate with our partners further afield, mm. like the Mossad, uh, MI6, the KGB, and a host of mm. others. Uh, so RD performs a very important role. That is why your passport is a security document. Uh, your passport is not printed by the passport office. It's printed by RD. And the research department oversees that with all the security features. Mm. Then we have DI and the Defense Intel. And DI has to do with gathering intel about the movement of soldiers from both adversaries and allies within the region. Uh, so anytime we move our army, it's born out of minute you know, gathering of intelligence. So when you add that to uh, the very salient points that have been raised by my good brother, mm. uh, Sani, it gives you a broader understanding mm. of what security is. Mm. And when someone gets killed and Ghanaians become so alarmed, mm. unless maybe you don't belong to the intel community, um, the issue of kidnapping, mm. I saw people make a lot of mm. you and cry mm. out of it. Mm. Kidnapping has been going on for so long. There are cases we are working on mercenaries that come from outside to kidnap and then rob people of all their possessions in Ghana because they are working in the mining sector or in the oil and gas sector. These are cases no, we Mr. Ibrahim, on hold on, day. hold on one second. So what you are saying in other words yeah. is that all these recent incidents that have happened, they are not that new. has all of us up in arms are just... They are just not new. They are not uh, new. Yes, people... They are not new. And uh, when people raise eyebrows, sometimes we get a bit you know, surprise. That is why the illness lies upon us to allay people's fears. Mm. When I see media people read news, mm. 
and they use a baritone voice, created an impression <laughs> that the world is coming to an end. Mm. There are worse cases we are, going, we are working on currently than those you have seen. But I must say, because the people involved are public figures, no, but I'm sorry, Ibrahim, I'm, I'm sorry, I slightly disagree here. Because except the, the, the case of the murdered okay. private investigator, you know, um, 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 Ahmed Swali, these murdered girls are ordinary. ordinary the seven, the, I mean, sorry, I said murdered. I mean, the, the, the kidnapped girls, the seven kidnapped girls. They are just ordinary 18-year-old, 16-year-old girls, you know. So I understand that. Perhaps Ahmed Swalis has a certain national appeal because of who he is. But then how about this one with the... I'm talking about the, the phenomenon of okay. abduction or kidnapping. Okay. It's entirely not new. Uh, and I, I tried to create a nexus between that and the high profile cases. Mm. Uh, because since the beginning of this new year, people have mentioned the Gapoa woman, yes. a brother who just got killed recently. Yeah. People are mentioning co contract killing and all mm. that. For a pittance, people are contracted to kill in Ghana. Um, but of course, because the lenses of the media are much sharper see, now. These are all would... areas into which I re I'm happy you bring it up because it's one of my biggest you know, issues that I wanted us to talk about this evening. You know, but I want us to get there, you know, slowly, slowly. The point is that today is only what 20 something days out of the first month of the year. And already in January alone, look at the, 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 the security issues that have come up. Right, so okay, so I, that, that is why perhaps my colleagues would read the news with a baritone voice, the you know. Is, the issue we cannot have a perfect society. Yeah. Um, even the most sophisticated societies like America recalls about 34,000 deaths as a result of gun-related injury. Brazil alone in 2017 uh, suffered about 35,000 homicides in Brazil alone. All right, so but the problem is, like my brother has rightly pointed, it is nothing new. But like you also rightly pointed, when it becoming widespread, then we have every reason Accra, to be scared. You see, and when you look at the crime stats, all right, that was recently released by the police, you'd realize that murders, kidnappings, um, home invasions, robberies are on the ascendancy. And I'm particularly worried and quite surprised that despite the uh, uh, creation of the National Security Ministry, because mm -hmm. I do know for a fact that when President uh, Nana Kufuado came to power, one of the first appointments was Honorable Kandapa, mm -hmm. who is the National Security Minister in consistency with the Security and Intelligence Agencies Act. So I was thinking that obviously it's an indication of the importance the president attaches to security. However, we have security rising by the day. Uh, I mean, insecurity, I must mm. say. Uh, more murders happening, more kidnapping ha kidnappings happening. And it's becoming widespread. And recently, I was speaking with a friend. I was like, what is going on? Um, I'm a security analyst. Mm. My brother is a security consultant also. Mm. We talk about security every day. Mm. Um, we advise people to take certain precautions to keep themselves and their communities safe. So what it means is we are invariably pushing out of job these armed robbers. So in one way or the other, we're stepping on their toes. You are a journalist. I'm sure you might have discussed certain issues that some persons out there would not be excited about. And mm. considering the spate of assassinations, then we all have a reason to be scared. Mm. And I'm particularly also worried because our investigation regime is extremely porous. Mm. Um, I have always been an advocate for the establishment of a DNA database of um, a fingerprint database because in other jurisdictions like America crimes that were committed when there was no DNA database in the 70s are now being solved because of DNA. Example is the so, Golden so, State so Killer. Let, let's just break it down so everybody understands what you're saying. In other words, in this country, we don't have it. No, we don't have it. Recently, 
I was on 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 one of the um, TV networks with mm. the public affairs director of the police service. Mm. I raised these issues. Mm. Then he said, "Yes, we do have it. Indeed, mm. he indicated he indicated that we even have a fingerprint database that is West African in nature." Then I asked him, "To what extent have we been able to use it to resolve many of these uh, cases that comes before the police?" I have been a victim of burglary before. When they were living, they left the in a quest to uh, uh, flee the the, the scene. Mm. They left their torch lights. They touched so many surfaces, mm. including the door handles. Mm. And the police didn't seem to know what to do upon arrival at the scene. And we all know full well that in Ghana, the first respondents are the police. And mm. you, when they come, they themselves, <laughs> my brother, they contaminate the scene. Oh, they I, touch evidence without gloves. I'm sorry to they make very <laughs> bad jokes at this point, but there's this really funny joke that somebody told me about how an accident had just occurred. The police arrived, you know, brought out a rubber bag and started, you know, yeah. scooping the sand from, you know, for investigation. Sorry. Yes, um, you know, one of the greatest challenges we have mm. is an issue of perception. Perception? Yes. Okay. Yes. And we do retraining for the police officers and then we do retraining for other agencies and that fall within the wide net we are discussing today. And I'm not so enthused about the way we bastardize the hard work mm. of very fine women like you mm. who are in active service and young men mm. uh, that are sacrificing for this country. Mm. You see, the Ghana Police Service is brought they are they are highly respectable units within the service mm. we all drive around town last night i drove tonight everybody will drive mm. chances are when you hit a checkpoint they don't really bother to do any proper check mm. uh, or any first can check mm. you just give them one cd five cities or ten cities mm. but if you consider those excesses you meet on the street as a general reflection of what the gps is Knowing so well that it is only MTTD. Mm. There are police officers that are better equipped than an ordinary soldier. Mm. And we have the CTU, mm. FPU, mm. and then we have the police intel and a host of others. And just as my brother has indicated, on the surface, uh, we have a direct brush with a few that don't exude the needed professionalism. Mm. But underneath the surface is a yearning desire to get the job done. So does it boil down to lack of logistics? You mentioned the lack of a database mm. uh, for people's fingerprints. The assassination of our brother, the investigative journalist, mm. I'm surprised people are still pointing accusing fingers. Time and again, we've recommended that, um, yes, if you have surveillance cameras on the intercity boulevards, how about alleyways that lead to our homes? Mm. That is why you need the CCTV cameras the most. And so private citizens, we are getting a bit wary of the seeming inertia on the part of state authorities. Mm. I remember some international partners and I on the back of the Kwabinya incident. We actually came with a very good proposal. And we said, okay, if you needed surveillance in all the police stations, we could provide. Mm. We did feasibility studies. We met the people that mattered, uh, only for them to give the contract to someone else. Then I heard the vice president announce that we were going to install CCTV cameras across the country. Mm. It's been over a year. And it hasn't happened. Yeah, so if there was even one CCTV camera, and my brother at Jatike can even do that for the state, because he sells <laughs> surveillance cameras as well. Mm. We wouldn't be pointing accusing fingers at people, mm. and we just have to rely. Recently, there was an incident at Bost mm. when the investigation was ongoing. We had to go knock on the door of a private citizen and ask for the footage from a surveillance camera. Mm. So I see no will on the part of the state mm. uh, to do the basic things that are required for security. So we go a step further to blame the young men and women that are sacrificing and they go on patrol at night mm. uh, with no guns they mm. go on patrol with no bulletproof vests mm. i meet them at checkpoints sometimes i spend up to three four hours beyond midnight 
at various checkpoints. Mm. I ask you, I ask the police officers, why don't you check the boots? Um, I ask them, why do people get here and, and you say your colleague has gone to buy Indomie, for example? Mm. And I've proposed all of these. <coughs> How much will it cost this country to, you know, contract a catering service mm. to those basic welfare basic. things? So and what, Ghanaians what you will are see saying, a tremendous increase in the performance of the police of the officers. Police. What you're saying is that let's not blame the policeman at, on the surface. Yeah. Let's blame the system, yeah. you know, and, it, and its inability to cater. The one you said was trying to pitch fingerprint impressions with a policy. Mm. Did you ask how he even got to the crime scene? Mm. Sometimes someone who has been beggled is questioned, how do we get to the CID headquarters? Mm. So it boils down to logistics. Logistics. And the buck stops with the policy makers. You Not the policeman. Go to the Not US the and other countries. Mm. You are scared to even think of pulling out a dollar to give the police officer. He looks well fed. <laughs> He's okay. I, mean, I understand what you're saying, and I totally yeah. agree. Yes. I agree. Yeah, with when you. I talk like emotionally like this, people say teachers are not paid well, but they go to the classroom I anyway. To, I, I wasn't going to make that <laughs> yeah. example. But my point is yeah. that sometimes the person who fronts the establishment also has a duty, okay. you know, because like it or not mm -hmm. this is the face we see and this is who we see as the police so, you know, <laughs> you know the i'm sorry let, sorry yeah. sorry to catch you let That's me just it. do this quickly well okay. the, the, the whatsapp line is 026 084 i'll say that again it's 026 084 please do send in yeah. your whatsapp you know or text message tell us what you think if you have any questions Mm -hmm. Sorry, please go ahead. Um, I, 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 I think I saw an interview um, involving a journalist and COP Kofi Boachi. Mm. He was asked about police uh, corruption. Mm. He indicated emphatically that indeed he accepts that to a very large extent there's a corruption within the police service, especially with MTTD. Mm. But he also indicated that we only get to see the police because they are out there. We deal with them on daily basis, but they are more corrupt institutions. And I seem to agree with him, hook, line, and sinker. Mm. Um, indeed, we have some fundamental issues with the police, but it goes without saying that I have always said this on any platform I find myself. The police has played a very critical role in harnessing our democracy over the years. And I always say that on a daily basis, you have thousands of young men and women out there, you know, ensuring that our communities are safe. We don't get to report that. But as soon as we have one officer doing something wrong, then in our quest, I'm, I'm speaking as a journalist myself, because I'm a member of the Ghana Journalist Association. <laughs> and you know, we love sensationalism. You know, we it's love the man that. Gentlemen, you are forcing me to be the devil's advocate here. You know, considering both of you are advocating so strongly for the police. Mm. I we agree with you. I agree with you. But let, let's, let's, let's accept that mm -hmm. there are SSs. You know, for I, and I could give a countless examples. Mm -hmm. You know, let's talk about this police man, you know, who beat up that woman at the, uh, uh, what's it called? Yeah. The, the, the banking bank. hall. Yeah, but you know. also connected the pieces. You see, there are sequential events that culminate into what you see as the eventuality. I'm sorry, I don't want to. I, don't, I, I, I really no, no, want some to go said along. She actually spat on him. But we all saw uh, the video. And then, you see, that was why I had issues with number 12, and rightly so. Uh, video footage that is amenable to editing cannot stand in a court of competent jurisdiction. We are doing this interview. It may run for an hour mm. or less. Sani may make a lot of wonderful submissions. Mm. I may as well. But whoever wants to use the footage will decide what goes out there. Yeah. And that is why I think when Ghanaians jump to a 30 second clip to pass judgment because it's gone viral on social media, then it means we are losing the bigger picture. So let's go beyond audiovisual, you know, pieces of evidence that are casual and transient and mundane. But and unfortunately, Mr. Ibrahim, look at some of in the this issues. instance where somebody is videoing with their own phone, unfortunately, there's no editing. No, no, no. no, 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 no there's no editing going on here. The person shows you the parts you need to see, 
Exactly. So mm. you need to cross-examine people, find out what. And then we don't have polygraph tests here. Mm. Uh, my career background for half a decade uh, was in diplomacy. Oh, wow. um, before I went into consulting full time. Mm. Um, an embassy is one of the safe havens mm. uh, of spies, you know, espionage. Uh, so every now and then, when you work for diplomats, they want to cross check where your allegiance is, especially when you work for a turbulent part of the world. Uh, so polygraph, um, people have mentioned a few names in the case of uh, the investigative journalist. Mm. And get the people connect them to the polygraph device. When a person tells her, it's a lie detector. <laughs> uh, but here... But in, uh, uh, but in, in many cases also, <laughs> yes, um, polygraph also always, yeah. um, it, it generates persons of interest or leads in investigation, but not always admissible in a court of competent yeah. jurisdiction. And indeed, if um, an investigation is going to be conducted, yeah. then the issue given thorough hearing in yeah. court, obviously, they would call for the full tape. Um, yeah. I'm also not someone who, the full th tape. there's no way they can, they can pass the judgments tape. with that. But Amma, like mm. I indicated, we have serious issues with the police service, okay? Mm. In as much as we're concerned about those issues, we should also be concerned about the good things they are doing. One of my biggest issues with the police service is even the recruitment process. Mm. On any time there's an announcement for recruitment, you see thousands of young men and women throng the various post offices, uh, the various banks to buy the forms, okay? And I asked myself, um, do all of these people, uh, like, are they really willing to put their lives on the line? Mm to uh, ensure we, you and I are safe I'll or they are so just looking for jobs. In the because reasons on, they give for wanting to be... I have spoken with the number of yeah, them. A number so of interested. them. And trust what me. What do they normally say? They're looking for jobs. There are no jobs. That is the fact of the matter. On an annual basis, we, we have a youth bulge, okay? On an annual basis, you have thousands of young men and women coming out of the various universities and other tertiary institutions and there are no jobs. So you see one person apply for to enter the police service another the same person would apply to join the immigration customs etc so it, it does happen that way so it is up to us or the the police command through whatever means to conduct some background checks mm -hmm. on these individuals but they don't do it not very long ago we had a, a case involving a number of recruits who were already trained on how to handle weapons mm -hmm. asked to go home because the certificates they uh, 